So uh, is it okay, Shiraz? Are you ready? Perfect, I'm ready. Okay, so uh, welcome to the Bootstrap seminar of this week. So today we have the pleasure of having Shiraz Minwala telling us about crossing symmetry in Chern Simon's matter theories at finite n and k. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very nice to be giving this talk. Uh, this talk is based mainly on this paper um, here that we put out uh, a few weeks ago, together with Umang Mehta, Chintan Patel, Kartik Sharma, and Shiroman Prakash, and uh, touches on various aspects of earlier relevant work. Okay, so let me start with an introduction. As everyone in this audience knows, S matrices are among the best studied and most interesting observables in quantum field theories. Now, S matrices are perhaps best understood in um, theories with a mass gap, uh, in particular in theories that I'm going to call trivially gapped theories. So these are theories that not just have a mass gap between um, the vacuum state and the first um, particle state, but also are uh, theories which below that mass gap reduce to genuinely trivial theories, you know, theories with a single vacuum state on, uh, on all topologies. Okay. Um, in such theories, an S matrix has many prop many well understood and sort of standard properties. Two properties that would be of importance to us are first, that the S matrix takes the form identity matrix plus I times tau. Where identity represents, you know, some delta function that has no scattering. And I times tau is an analytic S matrix, an, an analytic function apart from an overall momentum conserving delta function. Okay. The second property that will be of principal importance to my talk is that uh, uh, this tau in such theories, at least for the case of two to two scattering, has been uh, proved to obey uh, um, uh, the property of crossing symmetry, uh, which, as all of you know, is the, is the statement that the uh, S matrix for antiparticles is, can be obtained from, from the S matrix for particles by an analytic continuation. So, sorry, Shiraz, it's kind of a trivial comment, but just it's slightly more complicated than what you're saying here, right? Because even if you have, if you have like three, three to three scattering, like one particle might not interact and the other two might interact. So, so the the actual analytic function is the fully connected part of the S matrix, and and yes. uh, there is still and like non-trivial scattering in in the. In absolutely, the... I, I I agree. Everything I'm saying is really hundred percent, you know, correct for two to two scattering. And uh, then you have to factor things out. I agree. Okay. Um, okay. So, in contrast to trivially gapped the uh, theories, S matrices and theories with massless particles are structurally more complicated. Um, it depends on details, but in some theories of this sort, for example, conformal field theories, standard law asserts that uh, the S matrix is just not not well defined. It does does not exist in such theories. Okay. Now, there is a class of theories that lie somewhere in between trivially gapped theories and theories with a massless particle. And these are theories which are gapped, but flow below the mass gap, gapped in the sense of ma massive particles, but, but below the mass gap flow not to completely trivial theories, but to topological field theories. Okay. Now, you know, since at very low end, the very long distance physics of these, these theories is governed by a topological field theory, um, you might expect that S matrices in these theories are sort of different from their genuinely gapped counterparts. Uh, however, since there is no continuum of uh, low energy states going all the way down to the vacuum, you might expect that the uh, sort of pathologies of S matrices, uh, you might hope that the pathologies uh, of S matrices that appear in, let's say, conformal field theories are absent. Okay, so this looks like a good place to be to study a, th a theory where there's some interesting IR physics but hopefully without pathologies. Okay, so in today's talk, I will study a class of quantum field theories of this intermediate sort. The th uh, th these are theories that, that flow at um, uh, low energies to uh, topological theories. The theories I study will be uh, uh, in two plus one dimensions, and they consist of Chern-Simons theories coupled to massive matter, okay, in some representations of the Chern-Simons gauge group. Now, um, the main reason I study these theories rather than some other potential examples of the kind I'm interested in is that matter chern simons theories have been studied intensively over the last 15 years or so and very well understood. 
Um, and in particular, John Simon's theory is coupled to fundamental matter in the large N, large K, Toft limit have been shown to be basically solvable. And many quantities in these theories have been computed uh, exactly as a function of the Toft, cu Toft coupling. Um, the point that's of interest to me in my talk is that one of the quantities in these uh, theories with fundamental and therefore anti-fundamental matter um, that has been computed is the S matrix. And the computation of this S matrix has revealed some sort of surprise. Um, in particular, uh, and we will see this in all in much more detail, but if you take scattering of two fundamentals, the scattering can happen in a channel where uh, the fundamental is coupled either to the symmetric or to the anti-symmetric. Uh, if you take the scattering of fundamental with an anti-fundamental, uh, the scattering can happen in a channel where it couples to either the singlet or the adjoint. Crossing symmetry is the property that asserts that, uh, um, let's say that, that, that the uh, uh, scattering for uh, of fundamental with anti-fundamental is determined by some analytic continuation once you know the, um, the, sc the scattering of two fundamentals in both their channels. Okay, Explicit computations in this large end limit found, found in sort of a bit of a puzzle. But the two puzzling features in these computations. The first one was this. The first one was that, that the, when you actually computed or guessed, and by now this really computation, the, 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 the scattering uh, matrix in the, uh, for fundamental, anti-fundamental in the singlet and adjoint channel, the adjoint channel works sort of perfectly. You get the analytic continuation from, uh, uh, from particle particle scattering. However, the singlet channel, the analytic continuation, this TAC, which is the naive analytic continuation from particle particle scattering, uh, appeared multiplied by a sort of puzzling factor. This factor was, oh, sorry, this fact, factor was sine pi lambda by pi lambda. Lambda is the Toft coupling. I'll define it in more detail as we go on. Okay, so this was puzzle number one. Puzzle number two was that the identity piece, the part that was just forward scattering delta function, also was modified in this theory instead of being appearing with one or with minus a uh, minus one in my conventions it appeared with uh, uh, with plus i times one it appeared with uh, uh, with a factor that uh, um, uh, uh, that differed from one by this by this term which is cos pi lambda minus one you know so the this 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 s matrix here we've already taken out the one piece so it should have been just completely analytic with no forward scattering delta function yet um, there's an additional forward scattering delta function and um, if you put put it together with the one you find that what it basically does is renormalize that one the coefficient behind that one to a cos pi lambda okay so explicit computations found these two puzzles so it uh, suggests there's something interesting going on here and this is uh, uh, we're going to try by the end of these this talk to explain this explain this data. Okay, so the first strike, uh, please, of course, stop me for questions whenever you, you like. Um, the first striking feature of the amplitude is the unusual looking coefficient behind identity. Okay, so as I said, instead of the S matrix being one plus analytic, in this case, it's cos pi lambda plus analytic. Okay, now this feature was understood in for instance, in our paper eight years ago, I'm very briefly going to be reviewing it so that we can get it out of the way and focus on what's going to be interesting to us. Let, let's first um, um, let's first try to understand why you know in order to understand why the, the one behind you know uh, the the coefficient behind one gets modified. Let's first try to understand why in ordinary situations the S matrix is one plus eta. Okay. Now, scattering can, happens when two plane waves come and impinge on each other. Um, we can sort of move to a center of mass type coordinate in which all the action is in relative coordinates. So in this coordinate, there's basically one plane wave coming on a center of, impinging on a center of mass. Now, in a gapped massive, in a genuinely gapped massive theory, this, uh, the part of the plane wave that is far from the scattering center just moves, keeps moving, it does nothing. Okay, all the scattering happens in a certain uh, certain beam around the scattering center. Uh, since the part of the plane wave that is far from the scattering is infinitely is infinite in extent, 
the small path that actually scatters is it's very small perturbation on that, that big guy. And it's the fact that this big guy just keeps going through that gives you the one. And then the tau comes from the scattering of this little beam that actually is near, this, near the scattering center. Only near things scatter because of the mass scatter. Okay, the, the fact that tau is analytic then follows from the fact that, uh, you know, the path that you get for tau receives contributions essentially only from a finite number of partial waves, or more precisely, the contributions from large partial waves die off very fast, and that, that ensures analyticity for tau. So this is how things usually work in standard theories. Okay, now let us specialize what I just said, so far, again, sticking to standard theories, to two plus one dimensions. There's one thing special about two plus one dimensions already, you know, in, in, the, in the numbers for the geometry. And that special thing is this, the plane wave that comes and comes and impinges on the scattering center is a line because scattering is happening in a two dimensional space, spatial region. So the plane waves, the cross sections of the plane wave is a line. Now the scattering center breaks up this line into two topologically disconnected pieces. This would not be the case, say, in three dimensions. We could go round and connect. Okay. What happens in these, in these, uh, this is always true, but what happens in these topological theories, these theories that reduce to topological theories in the, in the IR, is this. While both parts, disconnected pieces of this line, just keep continuing through, unaffected, as, as they did for their massive counterparts, there's one, one interesting little twist. And the one interesting little twist is that the two parts that carry through pick up a relative phase with respect to each other. Okay, This relative phase is basically a consequence of the Arnov-Bohm effect because particles are passing through some sort of effective flux from two different sides. And so some 2 pi Arnov-Bohm kind of phase. And the magnitude of this Arnov-Bohm phase is fixed by the um, effective flux, which is 2 pi. Uh, the effective flux is 2 pi nu where nu is given by hr1 plus hr2 minus hr, what are r1, r2, and hr, uh, that goes this way. You see, in any, in any theory that reduces at low energies to a topological field theory, particles in that theory reduce in this low energy theory to Wilson lines. Okay, Wilson lines in this theory are associated um, to operators in the, um, in the associated chiral, two-dimensional chiral conformal field theory. HR1 and HR2 are the, uh, are the dimensions of these chiral operators, chi chiral primary operators, and HR is the dimension of the ch uh, chiral channel in, in which the scattering happens. So HR1 and HR2 are coupling to the representation R and going. So, okay, so this is a general formula. You could work it out for matter turn Simon series, but I believe it's just generally true for topological field theories in two plus one dimensions. The fact that we get this relative phase um, now, you know, this relative phase can be distributed between these two parts at will. That, that's sort of a gauge choice in your, uh, in your reasoning. But we can, we can choose to dis distribute it in a symmetrical way. And if we do that, this phase becomes e to the power plus pi i on the top, e to the power minus pi i at the bottom. And so these two guys, which would have combined together to give you one, instead combine to give you e to the power plus i pi, uh, i pi nu plus e to the power minus i pi nu by two, and therefore cos pi nu explaining that cos pi, nu, pi lambda factor uh, behind the one, uh, it turns out that this value of nu in the singlet channel in the large n limit is lambda. Okay, so this was the explanation, um, uh, this was the explanation for, for the modification of this identity part. This explanation was already in our paper from eight years ago, it's not new. Okay, I've just given you the review for, you know, completeness. Okay. Um, uh, and this, this feature was already noticed, but perhaps not explained in these words, in, in studies of uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics coupled to John Simon's theory already in the 1980s, Reisenhaar's, um, Jackie and collaborators. So, okay. Um, the rest of this talk, what I'm going to try to do is to explain the other strange phenomenon we found in this, um, in the scattering amplitude, which was the modification of crossing. Okay, now I am interested in uh, in these crossing rules in these um, these matter this uh, these the uh, matter theories coupled to Chen si uh, massive theory uh, theories of massive matter coupled to Chen Simon's theory. Okay, now in the limit k goes to infinity, 
theories of massive matter coupled to Chen Simon's theory essentially become theories with a global symmetry. Because in the limit k goes to infinity, the Chen Simon's theory is very, very weakly coupled, and uh, this theory is more or less ungaged, and you effectively get a global symmetry. So uh, as preparation for what for our analysis, it will be useful to remind ourselves um, how crossing works uh, in theories with the global symmetry. Nothing here is new, st standard, uh, but it'll set up the language that will be uh, that will easily generalize to what to what is new. Okay, so consider a theory with a global symmetry. Um, let's say that our particles transform some representations of a of some symmetry group G, for instance, S U N. And uh, consider a bunch of insertions, R1, R2, up to R, N plus N. Okay. Now, let T be some tensor that transforms in the product of R1, R2, up to R, N plus N, N, plus N. Um, I call T an invariant tensor of simultaneous rotations of uh, um, all the indices of T, leave T unchanged, that simultaneous rotations in G. Okay. Now, this tensor will be of interest to me for the following reason. This bunch of representations will label initial and, you know, my space of particles that are going to, uh, that are going to perform, that are going to participate in scattering. In particular, consider the initial particles to transform in RA1 up to RAN, and the final particles to transform in RAN plus 1 up to RAN plus N, but with stars, okay? Um, the stars are there because these are final particles. Okay, now a map from the representation space, the product representation space here, to a product representation space there, is the kind of structure we're dealing with when we look at an S matrix, because an S matrix is mapped from initial to final Hilbert spaces. Okay, and a map from this space to this space is uh, G invariant if, you know, the map uh, commutes with the action of G. Now the most invariant G invariant map can be written in the following way. These are our, uh, these are our initial state indices. These are our final state indices. And this is a tensor. It's easy to convince yourself that this map here is a G invariant map if T is a G invariant tensor. Okay. So in theories of the global symmetry, if we want our S matrices to be G invariant, these S matrices are parametrized by G invariant tensors, where the tensors transform in R1 up to R in M plus N, when the particles, when the initial particles in RA1 to RAN, and final particles are N plus 1 up to N plus M star. Okay, fine. Now, notice that when you've got a tensor like this, you could split up the indices in any way you wanted. If we were studying these as initial and these are final, I would perform the split I just did, but you could perform some other split. And so the same tensor parametrizes different kinds uh, of scattering processes. These are basically the processes related by, um, uh, these are basically the processes related by crossing. Now, the full S matrix um, is, uh, consists of, you know, these, these index space S matrices times functions of momentum. And uh, the claim of crossing symmetry in theories with the global symmetry is that the S matrices corresponding to, you know, the same map, okay, are and uh, but with different divisions of the tens of the particles into initial and final, uh, but with the same invariant tensor, are analytic continuations of each other. Okay, now when performing practical computations involving uh, uh, theories with the global symmetry, it's sometimes useful to to work with a particular basis, to work with some, you know, some basis that has some nice properties. Um, the thing that will be useful about this is that we will, uh, that it allows us to work in a basis in which unitarity takes, the unitarity relation takes, an, uh, takes a nice form. Okay, so I'm going to, you know, construct such a basis. Let RA1 to RAN, you know, the klebsch gordon decomposition of these representations be written as sum over QA SA, where SA are, QAs are integers, positive integers, and SAs are representations. Okay, now in the, so what I'm doing is taking the initial particle space and decomposing it into irreducible representations. Now, many such representations might appear. Okay, now in each of these representation spaces, I'm, I, I, I make an orthonormal basis, okay, uh, or, or vectors that are, uh, 
uh, belong to different representations are obviously orthonormal, uh, orthogonal to each other, and vectors that belong to the same representations are made orthogon orthonormal by choice, by, by choice of basis. Okay. So I make such a basis in this, in this, in each of these representation spaces. Okay, and then with such a choice of basis, I define this quantity. I sometimes I'm going to call a projector. Sometimes perhaps it's bad terminology. Um, in which what I do is I take one of these basis vectors for the uh, initial particle space and multiply it by another basis vector for the fi final particle state. Okay, it's basis vectors of the same uh, same representation A. Um, it's labeled by a degeneracy index R prime for final, R for initial, and we sum over all internal indices in the representation. Okay. It's very easy to convince yourself that this is an invariant map. That it, it's a group invariant. It's more or less obvious. Okay, these projectors satisfy, satisfy uh, you know, just tracing through the definitions, it's easy to convince yourself these projectors satisfy many nice properties. For instance, if you take a projector and take the dagger of a projector, okay, that gives you a sort of projector. This is, uh, oh, sorry, I should have had a delta R2 R4 multiplying this. This should have been a delta R2 R4 times a projector here. Yeah? But this uh, projector is now a projector from a map, not from initial to final state, uh, not from initial to final particle state anymore, but initial to initial. Because all the final particle state you know, indices have been contracted away here, okay, in this multiplication. Okay. Also, this tilde projector here obeys a completeness relation. This makes sense because now this projector maps from one space to itself. And so identity is well defined in this, this space. And if you sum over all A's and you sum over you know, all R's with R equal, left and right R's being equal, this is identity. This is just a completeness relation uh, in the initial particle state. Okay. Now, why have I told you all this? I told you all this because well, uh, it's uh, we've already seen that these projectors are invariant maps or correspondingly the, the, te the corresponding tensors are invariant tensors. Easy to convince yourself that the, this is a basis for all invariant maps, all invariant tensors, it's sort of obvious. Okay, um, so the most general S matrix can be written in this form. It can be written as an S matrix here, multiplying an invariant tensor, uh, these projector type tensors summed over A, R, and R prime. Now, the nice thing about this, this, this is just some choice of basis in the space of invariant maps or invariant project, uh, invariant maps, let's say. However, the nice thing about this choice is that because of these properties, the equation of unitarity, S, S dagger equals one, turns uh, into a sort of nice, simple canonical equation into these functions of momentum. And it turns into this equation. It turns into um, the, the, the normal convolution we would do over momentum, momenta in, in the unitarity equation, coupled with a matrix multiplication in this degeneracy space. This R prime is contracted and summed over. Okay, so unitarity in, in this basis becomes just the usual kind of unitarity equation you'd have with convolution over final particle uh, momenta, uh, but with one extra complication, when there are degeneracies with the same uh, representations, you've got a matrix multiplication in that degeneracy state. Okay, so the unitarity equation for, for these component functions takes a simple canonical form with this choice of basis. So that's a nice thing of this, uh, that's a nice feature of this basis. Okay, now, now that we've chosen well, sorry, this basis, we can sorry. ask, can, in can this I, basis, yes? Can I ask you a question? In the previous of slide course. you had in- uh, I'm, I can't hear you very well, John. In the previous slide, you yes. have SI in the right hand side. Or yes, that? SI is the forward scattering delta function. Yes. Ah, okay. You just mean um, yes, delta function. Okay. Yes, just just these delta functions. Yes. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So, um, right. So, um, now that we've chosen a choice of basis, we can ask how. Um, in the, with this choice of basis, how, how, uh, um, how crossing symmetry works. Now notice that our choice of basis was sort of predicated on the particular division of our representations into initial and final. We coupled all the initial representations into some state and all the final representations into some state. So the, so the basis was 
depended on how we sliced our representations into initial and final. Okay, so if we work with some other choice of crossing frame, some other choice of initial and final, we do the same thing and then re-express the projectors in one basis, in projectors in the other. Actually, that's best worded in terms of these invariant tensors because these projectors are sort of maps from one space to another. But as we've seen, there, all, all of these, these maps are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these invariant tensors, which, act, which are democratic among all the, um, all the, uh, all the representations. So we take these, the projector, the invariant tensor corresponding to projector in one choice of crossing frame, the invariant tensor corresponding to projectors in another choice of crossing frame, frame and just re-express one set in terms of the other. And that allows you to figure that plus the usual analytic continuation allows you to figure out the statement of crossing symmetry in these theories. Okay. Um, now, um, one last thing. Um, I've worked in the language of these maps you know, these maps so that I can multiply maps easily so that the unitarity equation can easily be formulated. However, you know, as you've seen, crossing symmetry is better worded in terms of these invariant tensors rather than invariant maps, because those are democratic among my choice of crossing frame. And you might wonder whether you could, instead of working in the language of maps and then moving to to these tensors work in the language of tensors any to start with and just work out what multiplication of two tensors means uh, and what taking dagger of two tensors means it's an easy thing you can do that it's an easy thing to do turns out that taking the dagger of a tensor is just complex conjugation of everything including representations okay and uh, multiplying two ten uh, two tensors is you know just taking two tensors multiplying them together and then contracting indices uh, so taking the multiplying t dagger with t it's taking two ten tensors multiplying them together and then contracting final state indices between the two okay so that's the multiplication process so with this rule we can just work always in terms of these invariant tensors which are manifestly you know crossing symmetric and uh, uh, perform the the operation that i talked about Okay, so all this has been a bit abstract, even in the standard case. So let me give you one quick example. Let's consider the case of scattering of two, fu two fundamentals and two anti-fundamentals. Okay, in the space of uh, two fundamentals and two anti-fundamentals, let's say, let's say i's are the fundamental indices and j's are the anti-fundamental indices. Um, the space of invariance, classical invariance is two-dimensional. One random basis for this Invariance is given by this guy and this guy, which is delta i j, delta i prime j prime, or delta i j prime, delta i prime j. Okay, so every invariant is a linear combination of these two. Now, using our rules for Hermitian conjugation, you can find out what the Hermitian conjugate of these index structures is. It's just raising and lowering, taking lower lower index indices and putting them up, and uh, up indices and putting them down. The interchange is fundamental and anti-fundamental. Okay, so this was just some random basis. Now, for particle-particle scattering, we want to work in the symmetric or anti-symmetric channel. It's easy to work out the projector invariant tensors in these channels. This is just either given these TD and TE. Um, oh, sorry, this should have been TD plus TE and TD minus TE, sorry. Um, uh, the, the, the TS is the, the symmetric projector is just TD plus TE by 2, and TA is TD minus TE by 2. So that you get an explicit expression for these these uh, the, 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 uh, the invariant tensors corresponding to these projectors. The re relevant multiplication rules which we worked out abstractly can be just verified. You take TS dagger times TS, you get basically TS again, but acting on initial to initial space. Similarly, TA dagger times TA gives you TA again on, on another space, but TS dagger TA is equal to TA dagger TS is equal to zero as we had predicted earlier. Similarly, the projectors for fundamental anti-fundamental scattering are this in the singlet channel and this in the adjoint channel. All their properties can be, the expected properties can be verified. Now, it's just totally a very simple thing to do to just take these explicit expressions for these tensors, for instance, these guys, and then re-express them in terms of these guys. Just a matter of it's very simple algebra. And we find that TS and TA are given in terms of T identity and T adjoint by these by this algebra. And then inputting this algebra into the fact that the S matrix is S matrix times index structure, we find sort of, you know, the dual transformation for the coefficients of these, these tensors. And we find that the, the uh, 
S matrix in the identity channel is the S matrix in the symmetric channel times n plus one plus S matrix in the anti-symmetric channel times n minus one by two. Similarly, S matrix in adjoint channel is S matrix in symmetric minus S matrix in anti-symmetric divided by two. Okay, so this along with analytic continuation is the prediction for classical, um, for, for um, uh, crossing symmetry in theories with a global symmetry like this. And this is the prediction that we found didn't quite work in matter John Simon's theories because it had that extra factor of sine pi lambda by pi lambda. So this is what we were comparing with when we said it didn't quite work. Okay, and notice that all, with these choices, all our S matrices just obey S dagger S is equal to one. You know, they've been chosen that way. So that unitarity is really, uh, is canonical in this basis. Okay, now that's all I wanted to say about um, uh, theories of the global symmetry. I'm now moving on to the, you know, to the new part of the talk, which is about theories with uh, of massive matter coupled to John Simon's theory. Um, yeah. Any questions or comments before we move? Them? Excellent. Now let's let's move to theories uh, to, to the scattering of of uh, matter in John Simon's theory. Um, you know, scattering amplitudes can be extracted from a trans from transition amplitudes from the past to the future. At least to all orders in perturbation theory, uh, these transition amplitudes can be computed uh, com can be computed by using the world line representation for the for the matter particles. Okay, and so it's some some, some sort of transition amplitude which consists of world lines which begin at in, in some specified way at the ini at initial time, end at, in some specified way at the final time, and then do whatever they do. And then you also have to do the path integral over Chen Simon's theory. Now, we're going to imagine that our space time is like a pillbox, except I've drawn it in this way, but I'm going to make the pillbox much broader than it's tall. Okay? And all my scattering data is going to be somewhere in the middle here and somewhere in the middle there, so that the, the scattering data never reaches the spatial boundary of this pillbox. We don't, the boundary is some artificial thing. We don't want it to interfere with the actual scattering process. We'll take it far enough away so it doesn't interfere. Now, in that situation, in Chen Simon's theory, we actually have boundary modes on a boundary of space-time, if we put something like this. But the Hamiltonian for these boundary modes is zero. Um, it's zero unless a matter field or some Wilson line goes and hits the boundary. We've arranged our setup so that never happens. So this, the Hamiltonian here is just zero. So since nothing happens here, we can take this path integral to Euclidean space and then just scrunch up that that part of the part of the path integral. So effectively, we're doing a path integral on a solid ball in Euclidean space. Okay, and nothing particularly interesting is happening at the equator. So the equator is just any other place in this ball. So now the path integral that we're doing after this analytic continuation is a path integral involving particle trajectories going from initial, you know, from this initial cap to the final cap of our sphere. And uh, uh, we're supposed to sum over all particle trajectories and also do the path integral over the Chern Simons gauge field. Okay. So here I've written that, that the kind of sum that we're, we're supposed to sum over all particle trajectories, do a, an integral over gauge fields, and then write, uh, oh, uh, with, and the weight of the path integral should be the John Simons action for pure pure gauge fields, as well as the interaction between the John Simons action and uh, uh, matter trajectories. Now let's do the path integral over the gauge fields. That turns these chunks, these particle trajectories, you know, for fixed particle trajectories. As far as uh, uh, particle trajectories for f when they when they held fixed, as far as the John Simons theory sees them, are just Wilson lines. So what we've got is some of our particle trajectories, Wilson lines in pure John Simon's theory, and then some action weighting these trajectories weighted by, for instance, the length of these trajectories, right? Okay, great. Now, Wilson lines in matter John Simon's theory are topologically invariant. Okay, so what we can do is to take these sum over trajectories and divide them into chambers, which are topologically equivalent, and take the Wilson line apart out. So we sum over chambers, once and for all compute the Wilson line of George and Simon theory, and then sum over all of this matter action over trajectories in any given chamber. Okay, so we've concluded that the S matrix schematically will take the form sum over topologies, and then some S matrix is function of momenta, that's all this, other, all this stuff, uh, times the Wilson line associated with that topology. 
Okay, but we can do more. Because you see, Witten taught us that Wilson line configurations that end on boundaries compute conformal blocks. Okay. So each of these Wilson line configurations can be expressed in, in terms of basis, a basis of conformal blocks. Now the importance of this point is this, that while these Wilson line topologies are infinite in number, you can think of you know, two particles winding around each other an arbitrary number of times, the number of conformal blocks is finite. Okay, so many different topologically inequivalent Wilson line configurations map to the same or linear combinations of the same conformal blocks. Okay, so we just rewrite the Wilson line topologies in terms of conformal blocks and plug that into this expression here. And that gives us an expression which tells us that the S matrix here is a sum over SI, which is some function of momenta, at times conformal blocks, or some sort of functions of positions which label momenta, times conformal blocks. Okay, where SI was the sum over all topologies of this alpha IT, ST, where ST was what was here. Okay, so all of the, this heuristic discussion was meant to mo motivate the following structure. The, the, it was meant to mot motivate the structure that the, the S matrix is a sum over S matrices times conformal blocks. Now compare this discussion with, with the discussion we had 10 minutes ago of theories with global symmetries. There, we, in, that, in that situation, we had S matrices are, some, are S matrices times index structures, these invariant tenses. Okay? So you see that in Matajan Simon's theory, um, conformal blocks are playing the role of these, um, these invariant tensors or these, uh, uh, yeah, the invariant tensors that we have in these, uh, these global theories. And uh, so now, so now um, uh, and in fact, th those of you who are familiar with conformal blocks know that in the limit k goes to infinity, conformal blocks, in fact, just reduce to invariant tensors. Okay, so this is really the natural finite k generalization of invariant tensor. So we are confronted with two immediate questions. First, just like we were when we were studying invariant tensors, how do we multiply to, we, we address the question, how do we multiply two sets of invariant tensors? Then second, how do we, uh, um, can we make these some blo uh, block analogs of projectors, um, which is some nice basis in which unitarity will take a, a given standard form? Okay. Um, now, in order to be so, so, let's take the first first question first. We needed to understand how to multiply two blocks. This, as far as I know, mathematically has not been looked at before. But of course, from a physical purpose it's uh, from physical perspective it's very clear what to do see these blocks in the wilson line representation but rep representing particle trajectories what we want to do for the purpose of unitarity is to continue these particle trajectories perhaps on the backward time and so we just take these the wilson line representation and glue it to another wilson line representation of of you know the partner conjugate block um this is very similar to the procedure that witten devised for computing inner products of blocks, except that we do this gluing not for the whole block, but only for half of it, the part that corresponds to the future. Okay. So this is our proposal for multiplication, or what we sometimes in our paper called compounding of blocks. This is what replaces just contracting the invariant tensors after complex conjugation. Okay. And from a physical point of view, it's completely natural. You just carry on the particle trajectories. Okay. And in the limit k goes to infinity, it reduces to this contraction procedure. So let me say, I've said this in words, let me say this in, in a diagram. Um, suppose I've got a conformal block, like, you know, a conformal block represented by a Wilson line configuration somewhat like this. Um, in um, order to, uh, you know, to compound it with another block, what I do first is to sort of take this part and flatten it out. This is just topological, so it's just for visualization purposes. Then I complex conjugate. Now, in, in block, when studying blocks, complex conjugation involves complex conjugation as well as a parity transform, reflection. So I take this guy to this guy, and all arrows run the opposite way. Okay, and then uh, in order to compound with some other block, I just put this on top of the other guy and glue all Wilson lines. And that gives me this new block. Okay, so this compounding procedure, uh, we define through this visual representation. Okay, now there's one uh, technical warning, uh, which is our compounding procedure is not really defined for blocks. It's defined for blocks plus sheet structures. 
you can see this as follows. A Wilson line configuration gives you not just a block, but a choice of sheet structure on the block. And we, what we've done is define the multiplication of two blocks through the Wilson line configurations. And so what we've done really is to define the multiplication of two blocks once we specify a sheet structure for each of the blocks. Okay? If I specify one, I change the sheet, sheet structure on the lower block and the upper block in some uncoordinated way, I would get a different answer for the, this compounding. However, this our procedure has a, this nice property that if you you do a monodromy transform simultaneously both on the upper and the lower guy, you don't get it. You you get the same thing. Uh, this follows from topological invariance of the Wilson. Okay, now, so we've defined how to multiply, how to compound two of these blocks. That was one of the things we defined for invariant tensors, right? Which was complex conjugating and then just, just contracting the final state indices. The next thing we want to do is to define these projector blocks. Okay. Now, if, when we were working classically, what we did was to take all our initial states and couple them to some representation. There's a natural analog of that while dealing with these blocks. You take the initial states R1, R2, R3, R4, Rn, and then couple them together to a final to some representation using Wilson lines inside uh, inside Chern-Simons theory. So this is some block, which is, this is some block, which is if the analog of our vector M that we talked about before. And then the projector is taking this RA and contracting it with another similar construction like this. So this quantity here gives us uh, the projector block, uh, the, the, the projector block um, that, we, that we're going to use in our construction. Now, uh, it's not too difficult to show that when you do these things right, you know, there are some normalization factors that I haven't included in these simple diagrams. You'll find in great detail in our paper. But when you do these things right, you can show that these projector blocks uh, defined this way obey, had exactly the same properties that the invariant tensors had for, for, for global symmetry theories. In particular, the dagger of a block like this compounded with a block like this gives us this block times the same same factor that I forgot last time, probably because I cut pasted, uh, of delta R2, R4. Okay. And, um, and uh, they all, there's also, um, the, the, you can also define a natural identity block. I don't know if I have a diagram, I probably haven't put a diagram for that, but the identity block is just a block where all particles just go straight through. Okay. It's like, and um, the, it, these projector blocks can be shown to be a completeness relation in the space of blocks. Um, in the particular example we study in detail in five minutes, I will sketch uh, proofs of the, some of these statements. Now, since these were the two properties we used to simplify the unitarity equation when studying theories with global symmetries, if we make this expansion with the this expansion for the S matrix, but now with the choice of projector blocks, the unitarity equation takes exactly the same form in uh, in terms of these these coefficient S guys as it did ten minutes ago. Okay, so. With, with this basis of projector blocks, our S matrices unitar obey standard unitarity conditions, exactly the same unitarity equations I, I wrote 10 minutes ago. Okay. And now how to get crossing for these standardly normalized S matrices, standardly normalized those that would be given unitarity relations. How do I get crossing rules? Well, now it's clear. Um, I've defined projector blocks, but projector blocks for their definition, just like for the invariant structures, dependent on the division of um, representations into initial and final. Each division has its own projector blocks, but the space of blocks is the space of blocks. And in that space, you just find the linear combination that takes you from one to the other, and that gives you crossing symmetry. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate this now in, in an example. Um, let, the example I'll choose is the one that we'd worked out ten, eight, eight years ago in this at large n large k, which is two fundamentals and two anti-fundamentals. Consider the block, correspond, you know, the, 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 the projector block corresponding to symmetric exchange for particle-particle uh, -particle scattering. That takes this form up to normalization I'll work out in a minute. Whereas the anti-symmetric block takes this form up to a normalization I'll work out in a minute. Now, how do I show that these projector blocks obey orthogonality relations? So why, how, if I compound one of the symmetric blocks with an anti-symmetric block, why do I get uh, zero? Well, um, 
really I should be compounding with the dagger of the anti-symmetric block. That's the same thing here. So, yeah. Um, well, you know, when you compound it according to our rules, you get this this Wilson line configuration. But now you consider this dotted line here, the circular dotted line, cuts the path integral along this dotted line. The path integral cut along this dotted line has only two Wilson lines coming out of it. One is in the anti-symmetric and the other in the symmetric representation. So it gives you the path integral representation of a block with one, one operator in the symmetric and the other op operator in the anti-symmetric. But we know that there are no, block, no such blocks. All two-point blocks vanish unless the, the representations are, appear conjugate, you know, in, in conjugate pairs. So this, uh, so this, co this compounded uh, block is just zero. Um, on the other hand, if I compound a symmetric with a symmetric, now I can do the same manipulation, okay, except that this time I won't get zero because now on this the dotted line I've got two symmetric insertions. I, I don't get zero, but you see, because the space of two, uh, of, two <coughs> of two particle blocks, of blocks with two insertions is one dimensional, this block is the same as this block, where instead of doing this complicated maneuver where I go through a loop, I just go straight through up to some number. If I want to compute what that number is, I just take the inner product of both sides of this equation with a simple block. Okay? And that tells me that that, that, you know, that inner product is some Wilson loop. So work through this procedure, it's sort of obvious. And what you get is that this alpha symmetric anti-symmetric is this Wilson loop divided by this Wilson loop. Okay. So now we found exactly what um, um, uh, what we have to do in order to get this really to obey the equation that we wanted, namely that the symmetric block compounded with itself uh, is itself. We have to divide by a normalization factor. And the normalization factor we have to divide by is this. So this quantity is really genuinely a, 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 a projector block. You can perform the same computation for singlets and adjoints. Okay, but going the other way. Okay. Once again, this is sort of up to normalization. This is a singlet block. This is an adjoint block. Okay. Um, these, uh, uh, the same kind of argument tells you that compounding the singlet with the adjoint gives you zero. You cut along the sky and it's zero. The same kind of argument allows you to find the right normalization for these guys. And you normalize them. And the, this, this gives you the, how you have to normalize it in order to be really a block. Okay. Similarly for the identity. Worked out by joint but identity. And now what we want is that we've got the identity block and some linear combination of the singlet and the adjoint. Uh, um, sorry, sy sy uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric. We've got the adjoint block and some linear combination of the symmetric and anti-symmetric. We can work out these linear combination matrix coefficients by taking inner products. Okay? So these linear pro uh, combination coefficients are given by this combination of inner products. So what we need to do is two things. First, we need to evaluate the inner product of the single, the symmetric and anti-symmetric block with themselves. Then we need to evaluate the inner product of the symmetric anti-symmetric block with the, the with the identity and adjoint block. Now these inner products are inner products a la Witten. Here we are uh, few, we are computing these inner products by by fusing all insertions. This is not compounding. This is genuine inner product. The kind that we didn't have on this page. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, okay. So, fine. So, all we have to do is to, to, do, to, to, do these pro, uh, to, do, to do these things. Okay. Now, there is one sort of irritating thing. Um, and it's the thing we least understand in this whole procedure. Uh, so, let me tell you about it. Um, in, in, in this game. You see, in taking this inner product with this, it's really straightforward. Uh, I'll show you how it's done. In fact, let me show you how that's done immediately. Um, uh, it's this part of this diagram. You take the symmetric and uh, anti-symmetric with the symmetric and anti-symmetric. You, um, you glue it. Okay, there are manipulations of the sort that I, I, I went through before. In the end, you get, without any complications at all, you just get this, the answer to this is this, this loop in either the symmetric or anti-symmetric. In fact, you can show quite generally that the inner product of any projector block with itself is the single loop in that in the representation that runs through that block. And this has a nice this is a nice quantity. It's called the quantum dimension of that representation, and is a very well studied quantity in conformity theory. 
So this inner product of the symmetric or anti-symmetric with itself is some very standard, easy, uncomplicated thing to compute. All of the fun in the computation is in this cross inner product. Now, in computing this cross inner product, um, we're faced with an irritating issue. And that irritating issue goes, goes as follows. What we want to do is to compute the inner product of, say, this guy with, say, this guy. Okay? And in order to do that, I have to be able to, you know, my, my, my inner product requires me to fuse uh, con corresponding uh, insertions. But in order to do that, I have to have the insertions at the same locations. Now, um, if I want to take this guy and put its insertions at the same locations as this guy, I have to do a monodromy move. I have to take this guy, this, this A, <coughs> and put it up on top of the F, after which I can legally fuse this guy with this guy, because they, then they're in the same locations. Now, the, the, the irritating complication is that there is an ambiguity in this mono, monodromy move. I could take the A either above or below, or in fact, take it by winding n times and then go above or n times and then below. I'm going to proceed now making a choice, and uh, we'll come back to that. I'm going to proceed making this choice here, and we come back to the issue with the choice. Okay. After having made that choice, the evaluation of the inner product of the adjoint with the singlet and the anti-symmetric is some straightforward, I mean, not it takes some doing, but it's conceptually straightforward. It's some manipulations. And in the end, you get this, you get, a, you get a clear answer where the numbers in that answer are something you can calculate. Okay. And this calculation was essentially done in one of Witten's papers uh, following up on his Jones polynomial work um, in some language. Okay. Fine. So putting it all together and uh, um, um, so now, now we know we've got all these inner products, we can express blocks in terms of other blocks. So putting it all together, these are the relations we get for the blocks. Okay. And, uh, the relations up to these phases, which we'll come back to in just one minute, up to these phases have these very nice n plus one q's and twos. Okay. Um, at this stage already, one can test level rank duality because um, um, if this relation is correct, it implies some crossing relation between S matrices. And that crossing relation between S matrices um, uh, or, the, or the crossing relation between dual blocks okay, um, uh, should be related to what you expect by the duality rules. The duality rules are essentially that up to some sign, uh, symmetric on one side gets interchanged with anti-symmetric on the other. Okay, and uh, uh, it's easy to convince yourself that this these relations that we get are, are, are crossing invariant. The fact that these Q numbers appear help help us. Okay, so if we if we uh, um, if we uh, uh, take this this business with these. With, with this change of basis of blocks, and then ask how the coefficient S matrices for these blocks transform under crossing. I'll, I'll be done in three, four minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we ask how these coefficient uh, S matrices change under crossing. Um, we, we get this, this answer. However, I told you that, um, you know, this answer was obtained by making a choice of sheet, sheet structure. When I took the A and F, I took it above rather than below. Um, we also computed what we would get for all possible sheet structures. The sheet structures are labeled by winding in. If we chose the nth choice, we would get this answer. Okay. So you see that these answers are very similar. They differ from each other just by a phase. And you might think that this phase is not physical. Okay. Um, you might think that this phase is not physical because, you know, overall phases in matrix elements and quantum mechanics might generally have no physical significance. However, you have to be a bit careful because that's true only of overall phases. Relative phases have great physical significance. And note that this crossing relation is a crossing relation just for that, that, um, uh, that we, that, that, uh, um, uh, this crossing relation here, we're proposing for tau. Um, 
the question is if we have this you mean know, tau with one phase a tau with another and you keep the identity part unfazed uh, these are physically completely different okay so given that um given that um we get many possible different answers um and given some sort of vague not very convincing physical argument for this this is the weakest point in our work i hope to come back to this and justify it better um we conjecture that these tau matrices come coupled with identity pieces that are that have that are also analogously phased okay the reason this is sort of plausible is this if you work just in non relativistic quantum mechanics you see that the identity part of your s matrix can be changed by a choice of gauge the phase of that identity part can be changed by a choice of gauge okay you can see this in an arnold bohm computation so what i think is going on but we don't very clearly understand this so we're just conjecturing it is that these different answers come in different choices of gauge which uh, um which changes also the phase of the identity part assuming that is the case all these answers are the same and are all um equivalent to these crossing relations mm -hmm. Where we've just taken out overall phase factors. Oh, sorry, Siraj, but I, you yeah. seem to have a new new I and a new adjoint. No, you have to seem to have. Yes, two, two uh, I is singlet, and adjoint oh, but, is. But the phases aren't the phases different in each one of the terms. Because yeah, the phases are different, but that doesn't matter because if the the identity part picks up the same phase in, in there is an identity identity part in the identity in the singlet channel. And there's an identity part in the adjoint channel. So you can have different phases in different yes, channels. You could have they, different they don't phases. talk to each other. Really. Yes, they're just on their own trip. Yes. 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 Yeah. But this part we need to understand better. Okay, it's the only way it makes sense. So I think it's true, but we need to confirm it. Okay. Now, assuming that this this weak part of the story is correct, we uh, uh, we rec all, all of these are equivalent to this crossing relation. Now, this is a crossing relation that's sort of very similar to something you've seen before. If you, if you were paying attention to the part with the global symmetry, we had the same crossing relation, except that we didn't have these, these square bracket and cues here. Okay. So what we, what we, what we, what we find is that um, the crossing relations in Mattach and Simon's theories are the same as their classical counterparts, except that every explicit number that appeared in the crossing relation is replaced by the Q analog of that number, where, uh, where a Q number, oh, I should have put in what a Q, the definition of the Q number, but the Q number is, you know, a Q number of alpha is alpha to the power, uh, is Q to the power alpha by two minus Q to the power minus alpha by two, divided by Q to the power half minus Q to the power minus half, where Q in this case is e to the power two pi i by kappa, Kappa is the shifted level of the John Simons theory. Kappa is n plus k. Okay. Um, so the final crossing relation is just this 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 relation with these with numbers replaced by q numbers. Okay. Now in the limit k goes to infinity at fixed n, or a q number a q goes to one in that limit q numbers re reduce to ordinary numbers and so this reduces to the ordinary classical uh, classical crossing relation. On the other hand, if you take n goes to infinity, k goes to infinity with n by kappa held fixed, these re uh, reduce to, to this thing. And you see that the identity piece the, uh, has the sine pi lambda by pi lambda multiplying this. This is exactly what, what was found both by ourselves and also in this recent paper by the Harvard group um, um, for, uh, uh, for the singular channel. Okay. Uh, so, okay, if assuming we can go back and carefully justify the slightly shady thing with the choices of phases we've got a clear answer for the uh, um, crossing relations for these things um, th these are for crossing relations for s matrices that have obey standard unitarity rules okay and uh, uh, they're very beautiful i think because it's just the classical form but with the numbers replaced by q numbers and uh, uh, they pass a test namely they re reproduce what we found by explicit computation at large okay so discussion we presented a systematic procedure to determine the rules for crossing symmetry in arbitrary matter and simon's theories at finite n and k a method as past subjects um it would be very interesting to perform additional checks of this proposal for instance to uh, 
tested out in you know explicit Feynman diagram computations, perhaps in mass deformed ABGM theory. There's been a fair amount, you know, 10 to, 10 to 20 papers on this, and a fair amount of confusion about this. Uh, because um, people who compute Feynman diagrams and these uh, uh, compute scattering amplitudes in these theories uh, find it confusing because they, the amplitudes appear not to obey stand standard properties, they appear to violate unitarity. Uh, with luck, the reason for that is that the structure of these amplitudes is wrong and that we, we analyze that correctly using our structure and we will find it all working. It would be nice to have that kind of check. It would be interesting to redrive what, what we've, you know, we've given some sort of structural story. Um, it would be interesting to redrive this from a direct analysis of Feynman diagrams. Perhaps the blocks that I've described above come out as a result of the, you know, IR divergent part of these theories. You know, often in S matrices, you've got uh, S matrices are like a divergent part and a convergent piece. My rough feeling is that in these theories, the analog of the divergent piece is the block, and the analog of the convergent piece is the S matrix. Okay, it would be nice to see something like that work out in a nutshell. Um, it would be good to understand better, understand global issues related to the conformal blocks. This is this irritating phase that I only half understood right at the end. It would be nice to, int to generalize our discussion to arbitrary two plus one dimensional TFTs coupled to massive matter. Um, and uh, I suspect it would not be too hard to find more you know, abstract versions of, of these these Wilson line tangles, uh, abstract things, uh, if that, if your tastes go in that way, that direction, and then generalize this to beyond Chun Simon's theory, at least for two plus one dimensional theories. It would be interesting to find more explicit answers, for for example, for SUN the SON theory. Um, we've more or less done this now, okay, and by fundamental matter as relevant to ABJ. Um, it would be interesting. Uh, um, to read on the S matrix bootstrap with these modified cross crossing relations, the large and vector John Simon's theories saturate bounds. I suspect they do. Okay, um, uh, at large n, you know, because the sense in which these large n vector theories are sort of free, uh, free theory should saturate bounds. And finally, I think it would be interesting to formulate Boltzmann transport equations with these mo uh, using these modified S matrices. Mm. This might have actually practical applications in something or the other, I'm not sure in what, and uh, it would be interesting to see whether the uh, equilibrium of these Boltzmann transport equations gives the modified um, uh, partition functions um, I had in a paper about a year ago, which has a modified kind of modification of Bose Fermi statistics, also involved in Q definitions, uh, like we found in this, paper. Uh, in this paper. Okay, that's it. Sorry for going over time. Your muted job. Sorry, thank you very much, Siraz. Uh, go ahead, Si. I think you you were first to the question. Uh, uh, hi, Shiraz. So uh, hi, I want to uh, ask you about uh, this uh, gauge dependent phase you are mentioning. Um, yes. Now I would have uh, so that that would be equivalent to say that the, the, there's some phase ambiguity in the definition of asymptotic states, uh, right? Um, the, so normally, um, in the S matrix where I can just label in and out uh, states with the with the fog phases, uh, mm -hmm. normally I, I I would expect that um, if I choose a phase dimension for the one particle states, of, uh, let's say for the particle at rest, I can define uh, then the general one particle state by a boost, and I would assume that will specify the the phase for all the in, in or out states. Um, is that expected to be the case? Do you expect that to be the case here, or do you expect that? There might be, even if I specify, you know, the, the phase convention for the one particle state, it still may not be specifying the, you know, multi particle states because. Yeah, uh, somehow I have the feeling that it's going to be more than that. Uh -huh. that, that there may be some ambiguity in phase and multi particle states that is not factorized in terms of single particle states. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, I accept, I understand your intuition, but okay, the kind of phase ambiguity associated with one particle state at a time is certainly okay. Mm -hmm. because that's just redefining single particle states. But, but a phase ambiguity, if it's some overall phase ambiguity, even if it's something that mixes indices of multi-particle phases, just looks physically irrelevant to me. Do you agree with that? It may seem unnatural, un aesthetic, but it seems physically irrelevant to me anyway. 
Um, I suspect well, that uh, uh, kind of I, 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 uh, uh, I guess that that uh, comes down to how how you it define as a public space. space to be. Right? It's not exactly Fox space. It's based on, based on the theory. If you if you're in an, if you have anions, it's not a Fox, not exactly Fox space. You yeah. Specify right. which anions you have, then you have the conformal blocks for those anions, and then on top of that, which anions you're talking about. Uh, so but that, that, would, wouldn't you agree that I can still write a, a complete orthonormal basis labeled by, uh, or let's say delta function normalized basis, labeled by the, by the momentum as long as I specify the orientation of the spatial momentum? No, I don't think so. You need to specify the conformal block you're in, and then uh, you can specify the other data. Because before you even put the particles, before you call particle so, particles, uh, they are just like defects in the infrared theory. So first you need to deal with that, and then you can talk about the dynamics. I, I'm not sure I agree that uh, the asymptotic states, so especially that you need to specify the, the conformal block. They still conform. leave, even if they're asymptotic, they still leave in Charles Simon's theory. Now, if you put a, if you kill Charles Simon's theory on a big circle, then you can discuss things differently. Then you have a, an actual chiral theory living on this big circle, and I mean, I, I was that was gonna be my question. So let's. I, I, I guess you're referring to the essentially the gauge index when you refer to the conformal block, but uh... you know, it's it's, it's not a, your, your your theory. It's a, it's a completely abstract gap theory, and it has topological aspects. So. Uh, well, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not trying to make a statement of how you construct asymptotic states starting from some other ingredients. I just want to uh, first know uh, how you uh, label a basis to to start with. Uh, I would assume that you should be able to write the orthonormal basis labeled by uh, the momenta. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, but I mean, you know, <laughs> I assume that that is possible to begin with. I'm not. I you think know. you need the momenta, and you need to specify which of the states you are in. I mean, the theory has multiple states if you're on flat space with a bunch of uh, anions. So there are some completely localized states that you know involve the whole of space time. And then on top of that, there is the information about what's going on in your little uh, local problem. Yeah. Gee, one, one, one thing about that is that if you've got, you know, if you've got a wave packet of something here and a wave packet of something there, and they stay sort of separated away, it looks like they're well-defined. But now you take this guy around that guy, and it, even though it's staying very far away, it comes back to something else. I understand it's that point. I understand that point. But that's not in contradiction with the idea that you can still write a basis uh, that's just labeled by the momenta, let's say, at which the uh, wave packet is peaked. Uh, you, what you are talking about is some... Uh, Details about the analyticity property of the S matrix. No, 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 no. I mean, you, you, you don't have a gapped trivial theory, right? You're not putting particles on top of a trivial theory. You have a non-trivial gap theory, and that must be your ground, you know, your basic point on which you're building. Uh, but I'm just talking about asymptotic basis, asymptotic space in Minkowski and space. The moment you put some particles in Minkowski space, if the gap theory is non-trivial, there is a space of states. But Before you even I mean, tell me the speed at which those particles are moving or whatever else, their, their very existence changes the river space. So, so, so uh, but that's not in contradiction with what I'm- uh, no, It's wait, not but... in contradiction, saying so you need the momenta on top of the basic information, which is which state the gapped theory, the, the, you know, the, the, the topological theory is in. And this matrix will be, a matrix which has both the momenta information and these extra indices. But where are they in Shiraz construction? Which is what Shiraz has. And it will. No, so Shiraz it's... only said the representation. No, well, where are the extra indices? The extra indices are in the blocks. Yes. You see, the blocks, a block, its structure goes this way. It's a bunch of index structures that couple representations in a singlet manner times function of position. So block is a generalization of just ordinary classical index invariant index structures. So the block has these indices. So we have. Uh, uh, but 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 I, I mean uh, this is not. I mean this is not so different from ordinary gauge theory. All you, uh, that I think all you're saying is that 
uh, normally, uh, if I have uh, these particles in different representations, I, I look at tensor product. Let's say if I'm in a singlet, there are different singlet uh, in the tensor product I, I can pick. Uh, just to let Kosh Mahal can try to index this. Now here you have some additional uh, truncation because the transcendence level uh, that that it, it, uh, not just the truncation. It's yeah. uh, it's more non-local. The 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 very the, the way you talk about the states really depends on where your particles are. And if you move your particles around, there is a flat connection in the space of states. But uh, oh, well, uh, I, I'm it talking about uh, you, you, okay. But, well, that, but 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 my question is about asymptotic states. So 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 for for as far as asymptotic states is concerned, I'm assuming the particle is living on the spatial circle at infinity, right? So so they're ordered in some way, and then they're ordered according to the uh, angle of the spatial momentum. I can I can you know the, the, that's the asymptotic state I want to be. Considering. But it's confusing. I I agree. I feel like you should be work, working in wave packets, which have localized to some degree. Oh, uh, well, I mean, you, you, uh, but as usual in the hog rule formulation scattering theory, you you start with a smeared operator, but then you always t take a limit. And of it, course, it it's non trivial the proof of limit exists. Maybe oh, the limit is subtle. Uh, of course, the limit is subtle. But but I, I'm just, I was, my question was really about conjecturally, what, what, what do you believe is the correct way to label asymptotic states? I, I'm not saying it's trivial to justify, in fact, I don't know how to, fully justify this. Uh, you, you presume you have to take some operator with a width line attached and you take some, uh, you, you smear it and you, you take some, some limits of the you know, smear function you know, evolve in, in time in, in a specific way. But uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not saying that I can't justify this. I just want to know conjecturally, <coughs> what, 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 is, what, is the, what is the statement regarding how the asymptotic states are labeled? Yeah, I, I, let, let me say the one concrete thing I can say about that is this, that uh, these funny phases that, that I didn't like, um, uh, that that looked ambiguous were more than just about in individual particles because they knew what what they coupled to, you know, associated with the block itself. So uh, I feel it's more than this. I agree I that I, one should understand this better. But I I feel that they, that they, that it's okay to be to have more famous ambiguity than this. And as a general point, you know. Overlaps between two states in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, two, two states in quantum mechanics, which are differ by a phase, will give you the, all the same physics. Right? Probabilities will be the same. So, so, yeah. So even if there was some greater phase ambiguity, it wouldn't affect physics, it seems to me. Right, it looks like you need to arbitrarily assign them positions on this. On the, on, in space, very far away, uh, and then I, I, the I, choice doesn't matter at the end, but it's a convention that you need to specify. Uh, so, so the, the thing is, uh, I'm imagining that if one has a LLC formula, then you can specify the phase of the asymptotic states. Uh, uh, so, so, so if you if you have some green function of uh, you know these. Fermion field with water line attached, and you can say that the LZ limit is supposed to reduce to this uh, S matrix, specific S matrix element. There is an unambiguous space in, in that, uh, uh, to, to the extent that these water lines are you know, regularized. I, I would certainly limit. like to understand this better. I, I'm not saying I understand it, and I, right. I would like to understand it better. My feeling is that in the end, the phase will be more, phase ambiguity will be more complicated. Davide, you, you said you had a question. I mean, a quick, it's, it's like an observation, but uh, if you were to regularize the theory by putting it in EDS, then, uh, if, you know, very large radius uh, ADS, then you would, an actual, would have an actual uh, caral CFT living at the boundary of ADS with conformal blocks, which would be paired up with your S, S matrix in a way that is independent of the, of this, in which, in such a way, this ambiguity goes away. Yes. I yes. I would guess. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. That, that 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 sounds very interesting, and I've wondered a little bit about it. In particular, I've wondered about the following thing. You know, we actually do. Well, there are two things one could look at. Um, but let's say we're doing what you say, su suggest, na namely try to look for uh, for John Simon's theory in the bulk. Right now, we actually do have theories with John Simon's theory in the bulk. Every ADS three times S three times T four compactification has that. 
and I've wondered why we don't see more interesting things there. But, but um, that sounds very interesting, and I, I think something I might even think about seriously. I mean, this is more about what you find in, infra in the infrared rather than what's there in the UV, right? What's, what's in the UV doesn't really matter. It's just if the infrared theory has a topologically non trivial theory, then on large EDS, you will have to have a boundary parallel algebra. Right. And in ADS 3 times S3 times T4 compactifications, we have, I mean, st in standard examples, you can have less theory with gravity, so I don't. I don't yeah, know if it's okay. so it topologically non-trivial. Okay, no, but thank you for that comment. Siraz, I had a question about your uh, previous slide. So you were, sorry, about the infrared divergences, but so, so what are the infrared divergences here in this gap theory? This is a right. no gap uh, well, mode. You know, there should be no infrared divergences, but there are these infrared effects, right? There are these infrared effects, which I think are coming about because there are no real two part. You, know, you can't really separate the two particle states because as we were discussing, if you take one particle around the other, no matter how, how far they mm -hmm. are, you, um, you, you, you pick them up. And, uh, um, at the level of computation, people see this kind of thing. You know, um, when you do Feynman diagrams, like if you look at the computations people have done with um, um, with ABGN theory, I haven't looked at all of them in complete detail, but uh, already you see <coughs> the fol following kind of thing. You see that um, you would get, you, you have these, you know, you, they work in del dot A is equal to zero gauge. Okay. And uh, it, it looks like in individual diagrams, you have infrared divergences associated with gluons. When you couple the diagrams together, these, these things go away, but in a sort of, uh, uh, I think they may leave some trace behind. Um, for instance, you know, when, they, when, when people com compute in four minus epsilon dimensions, th there's some trace left of uh, three minus epsilon dimensions. There's some trace left of these things with, which comes with epsilon because you know you have non-propagating degrees of freedom only in exactly three dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you take epsilon to zero, some part of that may be left behind. And these, that may give rise to the conformal blocks. So very vague, sorry, Joao. Um, I see, I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there are no real infrared divergences, but there are some infrared effects. And they may have the same Feynman diagram um, origin that infrared divergences had, is what I was thinking. Thank you. You know, same set of Feynman diagrams that you sum to get infrared divergences, you sum you will get these blocks. Yes, Barak. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thank you, Shiraz. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one question. So uh, remind me if I'm, if I'm remembering incorrectly, but is it correct that in uh, Sometimes in theories, for example, uh, fermions couple to churn simons. When you go to the IR, the churn simons coupling is uh, shifted effectively, effectively. Yes. In the higher theory. So, in in when I if I'm using your formalism, uh, should I use the shifted? Um, uh, you should use the IR level. So I'm always to, to be safe. I'm always dealing with massive matter. So yeah. you should use the the level of the churn simons theory you get in the IR. So after integrating out all massive matter. So also, for example, the checks of the uh, uh, level rank dualities are done at the, I, at the level of the IR. Uh, right. For instance, one of, the, one of the basic checks of level rank duality of these matter chain Simon series is that you take the, uh, um, you take the uh, theory you have, you go down to the IR, you get some chain Simon theory with some shifted level okay. on yes. both sides. And the, uh, uh, the two IR pure chain Simon theories should be, matter, uh, should be level rank dual to each other. And that works. But only if you use the IR. Oh, yes. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we should let uh, Shiraz go to bed. It's already very late in in India. I think. Thank Thank you very much, Shiraz, for this great talk. Now, thank you very much for the patience and the great questions. And Ji, if I have a better answer for you, I will get back to you. Thank you, Shraz. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye.